Okay, hello everyone. My name is Michael Downey and I'm very pleased to welcome you to the first AWRI webinar for 2018. Uh, in today's session, we'll look at grape bunch rots and thresholds for wine contamination. And joining me to discuss um, is Dr. Chris Steele, currently Professor of Viticulture at the National Wine and Grape Industry Centre at CSU. Chris conducts research with a focus on the impacts of fungal organisms on wine quality. Uh, Chris conducted his postdoctoral training in the UK, Switzerland and Australia in plant pathology and disease management. Now, for those of you in the audience, I invite you to join in today's conversation. To provide a comment or to ask a question, please open the Q&A section of the webinar, type in your question and click to send. Uh, if you'd like to get involved through Twitter, please use the Twitter handle at the underscore AWRI. Uh, the webinar is being recorded and will be available to view later this afternoon from the AWRI's YouTube channel. I'd also like to thank and acknowledge Wine Australia for providing funding and support for AWRI webinars. For those of you just joining us, welcome. The topic for today's session is grape bunch rots and thresholds for wine contamination and I'll hand over now to our speaker Dr Chris Steele to start the conversation. So as you know today I'm going to be talking about uh, grape bunch rots and thresholds for wine contamination. Now I should say right at the outset I'm going to um, concentrate on grey mould of grapes caused by Botrytis cinerea. I'm only briefly going to mention some of the other rots and the other thing that I will add right at the start is that we are going to be concentrating on grey mould as opposed to uh, noble rot or the desirable form of botrytis that we, that we like when we're trying to make perhaps some styles of sweet dessert wines. Now I'm sure for uh, most people that are attending this webinar you'll, you'll be familiar with Botrytis grey mould. There's an image of it on this title slide but I am going to uh, give you a little bit of a uh, overview of, um, of, uh, of Botrytis and the life cycle just to put the work into context and to explain how this work came about. So although Botrytis has been known for many many years and there's been much written on Botrytis grey mould of grapes and other horticultural crops. Management does frequently fail in vineyards, in some difficult vineyards. And so this was the context of, of this current study that if we're unable to manage uh, Botrytis in the vineyard um, in some seasons, what then can we do at the winery stage, at the wine production stage, and how much can we tolerate before there is a loss of quality? I'm then going to uh, consider some of the other rots and then finally move on to uh, some future directions for the work. So we'll begin by just saying a little bit about Botrytis cinerea and the life cycle. This is going to be a very brief overview. The uh, fungus overwinters in the vineyard on dormant canes and on vineyard trash as these specialised structures called uh, sclerotia. Um, they're, they're hard structures that are resistant to desiccation. And then in the spring, these uh, sclerotia germinate and release spores that we call canidia. And these canidia are the uh, infectious agents, if you like, that then infect the uh, growing tissue early in the spring. The canidia are spread by rain and wind, and we're primarily concerned with infection of the flowers and fruit. And it's the post raisin berries, of course, that are most uh, susceptible to um, infection late in the season. So just go through a few slides quickly. pre on Botrytis is relatively rare. I will mention it because it does occur in some extreme seasons where we're getting high uh, rainfall early in the season. And I suspect in these types of cases, what we're getting here is a uh, little bit of sugar just developing in the berries. So we're at the cusp of Veraison and uh, the Botrytis starts to kick off at that, at that point. There, there are several infection pathways. So um, one infection pathway is via insect damage. So light brown apple moth, which is a problem here in Australia. Um, this is a bunch prior to closure, pre on bunch. The moth itself doesn't 
cause the problem but it's it's the larval stage the moth lays its eggs in secluded places so the interior of, of a bunch for instance is a is an idle spot for it to lay the eggs the eggs hatch out the caterpillars then feed on the interior of the bunch and the damage that these uh, larvae or caterpillar cause then becomes a, a point of infection for botrytis. We don't see it at this stage though generally it's late in the season where we've got our post on berries and this is a typical type of scenario this is a bunch of chardonnay grapes and we can see the botrytis developing deep within the bunch there we've got some berry splitting a tightly packed cluster berries are splitting the barrier is being broken down and uh, the fungus is starting to grow and so we time our management around the susceptibility of of the plant to botrytis so at flowering and at post veraison and you can see that image on the right there where we can see the split berry in the middle of that image uh, that's going to be an ideal um, infection point for botrytis but our real issue is lack of fungicide availability late in the season and that's one of the reasons why management in the vineyard fails so this slide just is a summary i'm not going to go into management very much at all because that's the topic of another webinar we're going to concentrate on the impacts on wine quality and thresholds in a moment but just to go through these quickly the first two dot points there we do have a bit of control over we can select the right variety for the growing season so for instance one management strategy in the hunter valley region of new south wales what we recommend is to try and grow earlier maturing varieties because we know uh, it tends to rain uh, more later in the summer late summer rains so if the uh, crop can be harvested prior to the summer rains then we're not going to get any bunch rots so that's something you've got some control over uh, canopy management a good open canopy uh, is will assist in botrytis management so they're things that we can manage but the last two dot points there we've got very little control over we can't do much about the climate so if we get a season where there's lots of rain early in the season we, we can't do anything about that the other one of course is lack of uh, product availability and if you consult the AWRI dog book you'll see that most fungicides cannot be sprayed after EL stage 29 which is uh, just prior to veraison so in wet years such as 2010 11 um, no matter how good some of the management practices were if you had wet seasons like this then you just weren't you're going to get bunch rots anyway so if you look at this picture you can see on the slide now um, pockets of water in the vineyard lots of lush green growth in that vineyard because of, of the rain and this was immediately prior to harvest so it was difficult enough to get the the, uh, the machine harvester into the vineyard let alone manage the botrytis so we're up, up against a tough problem the other thing I'll just add before we move on to consider the thresholds is the ubiquity of botrytis in the vineyard it's present on asymptomatic hosts so this is a vineyard in South America but if we look at some of the crops or the plants growing in the intero space we can isolate Botrytis cinerea from these uh, ground cover plants and so that also represents an inoculum source so we're never going to get rid of it out of the vineyard if we have a bad growing season with lots of rain and perhaps weather damage to the vines then we're going to end up with this sort of uh, uh, sim symptoms that you can see on these bunches here this is Chardonnay again so that led us to the current study if we can't manage botrytis in the vineyard what are the thresholds does it matter how much we have and and what is the cutoff when we can still make something sensible out of the fruit and beyond that is there anything that we can actually do in the winery to perhaps uh, ameliorate the faults and fix up the problem after the grapes are harvested now when you consult the literature there are a range of uh, different thresholds quoted in various publications and these numbers range from one up to as high as 12 percent um, depending upon the wine style obviously for red varieties the threshold is going to be lower 
because of the production of lacase and other oxidative enzymes that will lead to browning. It will also depend upon the uh, wine style that we're trying to make and the, the price point that we're trying to achieve with the grapes. So that's one issue, conflicting information in the literature. But the bigger issue I believe is how do we quantify 1%, 3%, whatever the threshold is that we set? Is it one berry in 100 or is it one infected bunch in 100? And let's say it is one berry in 100 berries. Um, what about the amount of fungus growing on that individual berry? And so we set to try and more accurately quantify the amount of botrytis in a vineyard or in a, on a bunch of grapes. And then beyond that, to try and quantify and more accurately uh, determine the impacts that botrytis have, has on grape and wine quality. So the overall aim of the work was to achieve more objective measures of uh, grape quality and botrytis and the impacts on wine quality. So I'll now start to go through uh, some of our data and some of our results. And the um, slide that you're seeing here is uh, an early study conducted by an honours student at Charles Sturt University back in 2012, Kyra Boisery. And uh, this was on Semillon grapes harvested from Griffith. And you can see three batches of uh, grapes there that have been selectively harvested. The picture at the top are our control apparently healthy grapes. The middle picture are grapes with um, a lower level of infection of botrytis and the lower picture at the bottom of the slide is what we regarded as uh, the highly infected bunches. So here we're looking at bunches that you know well over 30 to 40 percent of the bunch was infected by botrytis. This particular season for this particular vineyard and region was, uh, was a bit problematic for botrytis. On the right, you can see the sensory analysis of the wines that were made from these grapes. And I'm sure it comes as no surprise to you that our highly infected uh, grapes, when made into wine, had mouldy oxidized characters. But conversely, the desirable fruity flora aromas that, that we wanted in the wine were diminished. And so that set us on the path to try and more accurately quantify the impacts of botrytis on grape and wine quality. In addition to this sensory work, the uh, student did some basic measures of uh, quality, and these are depicted in this slide. And these are pretty obvious ones. So our highly infected fruit had a uh, greater levels of gluconic acid that you can see here. Now, this can be attributed to botrytis, but I believe that um, within this fruit, there was also an element of aspergillus. And we know that aspergillus uh, is predisposed to producing high amounts of gluconic acid. Um, higher amounts of acetic acid, again, not surprising, damaged berries, greater growth of acetic acid on the berries as well. And of course, much higher amounts of lacase in our infected fruit than in our control fruit. And these types of studies, there's nothing particularly new about this. this. This is sort of well known information. But we wanted to go down into greater detail and look at some of the earthy mushroom odors. And uh, there are a range of these that are reported in the literature from as fungal contaminants, not just in grapes, but in other uh, other products and other horticultural crops and food products and also in waste water, in stagnant water and so on. And I've sh I'm showing you four of the more common ones here. A few things to note, they're simple structures, they're all volatile and they all have relatively low sensory perception thresholds. So the numbers that you can see there in blue are the sensory perception thresholds in different media. So the perception threshold varies from water to a 10% ethanol solution through to wine. And you can see that they're all at low levels, less than one mic microgram per litre. So the work that we're going to discuss today um, sought to more accurately quantify um, 
the formation of these uh, these types of molecules in grapes infected with botrytis and to look at the dynamics of these compounds during the winemaking process and ultimately to try and set thresholds. So moving ahead to more recent work conducted in 2016, um, this is roughly two years ago, almost to the day, we went to a vineyard in the Hunter Valley and we collected Chardonnay bunches affected with uh, different levels of uh, botrytis. And these were hand sorted based on the level of severity and placed into uh, bins that you can see in the slide. And in this slide, you can see Dr. Lachlan Schwartz, who was my uh, postdoc at the time. We sorted the fruit into five levels of severity and the five levels of severity are shown on this slide. So our zero level was our apparently clean, healthy fruit that was disease free. Our level one contained bunches that where we had one or two berries per bunch that were infected. Our level two had uh, up to five to 10% of the bunch infected as an estimate. Our level three had approximately perhaps 25% of the bunch infected. And our level four, which was an extreme level of infection had maybe 50% or more of the bunch infected. And you may be thinking, why, why would you make wine out of that level three and even four level? Well, we really wanted to have an extreme scenario to uncover the, uh, the types of molecules that the botrytis was producing in these infected grapes. So these grapes were then brought back to the experimental winery at Charles Sturt University, and then they were vinified in triplicate. Now, one of the problems that I alluded to a little bit earlier was how much botrytis was actually present on these grapes. And this is a picture that I showed you earlier. So here we can see this bunch. Now in our scoring system, that would probably be somewhere between a one and a two. But if you look at that image, you can see the botrytis is deep within the bunch. And that's quite a large bunch. It's, it's one of these Chardonnay bunches. And if we were to crack open that bunch, we would find the botrytis uh, throughout that bunch. And so perhaps a score of three might be more appropriate. So we wanted to more accurately measure the amount of fungal biomass that was present in these bunches. And so we turned to measuring agostrol um, in these bunches. And agostrol is a sterol. It's a fungal sterol. It's only found in fungal membranes. It's not found in plants and it's not found in, in animal cells either. So we, we used agostrol as a measure of the fungal biomass. Now I should say that agostrol is not unique to botrytis. It's present in all fungi and it's also present in the yeasts. So the wild yeast growing on the surface of the grape berry will also have agostrol. So even in our completely clean, uh, disease-free bunches that have no filamentous fungi present at all, we're still going to get a background level of agostrol. Despite that fact, we, we believe that this is a, a much more accurate measure of uh, measuring fungal biomass in these batches of grapes. So once we did this measurement, these were the numbers that we uh, got out of uh, these fruits in terms of the biomass of fungus when expressed on a gram dry weight of fungus per kilogram wet weight of grapes. And we did all sorts of things to, to derive the formula to, to, get this, uh, to get this calculation. So our control, apparently healthy, had 0 0.07 grams of dry weight of fungus per kilogram wet weight of, of grapes. Now that represents the background population. Undoubtedly, this is a commercial vineyard, there was botrytis in, the, in this region this year. Undoubtedly, some of that may be due to some filamentous fungi, but based on visual inspection, this fruit was clean and intact. Our level one had roughly 0.3 grams of fungus per kilogram wet weight. Our level two had one gram of dry weight of fungus per kilogram wet weight. Our next level had 1.82, and our extreme level had over five grams of fungus per kilogram wet weight of grapes. So these grapes were vinified. And I'll just briefly go through the 
wine making um, methodology, each batch divided into triplicates. These were crushed, destemmed. The must was pressed using a hydraulic basket press. Uh, pH and total soluble uh, sugars were solids were measured throughout. The pH in all cases was less than 3.1, so we didn't do an acid adjustment. Uh, there was then clarification by cold settling and the juice was racked, and then we inoculated with a, a fairly standard Saccharomyces cerevisiae culture, EC1118, the wine fermented to dryness and PMS added to ensure that we had sufficient molecular sulfur dioxide present. Throughout the process, we were taking uh, subsamples for our chemical analysis uh, that I'll now go into at this point. So this is the methodology now for the chemical analysis. As I've already said, we measured the fungal biomass by measuring the uh, agostrol using HPLC. Um, the material was then homogenized. We then measured the volatile compounds in the headspace. And we did two types of analyses. We were looking for a targeted analysis where we were looking specifically for those earthy, moldy uh, fungal characters that I discussed at the start. And we did an untargeted analysis where we were looking for some of the unknown compounds. We'll now look at some of the results of, uh, of this work. So this first uh, chromatogram I'm showing you is for infected berries, so the juice from infected berries. And on the next uh, couple of slides, the blue trace that you see there is from our clean, uninfected material. And the red trace there is from our most highly infected, our level four infected berries with botrytis. And the first thing that we saw, so we run along the chromatogram, we've got the retention time down the bottom there, we're seeing the disappearance of a number of carbon-6 compounds, hexanol compounds, that are going in our infected berries and the appearance of some additional C6 compounds um, as a result of infection. We believe that this isn't specific to botrytis and this is in fact due to breakdown of wax on the berry surface. So this image here is wax platelets on a grapevine leaf. It's not, not a grape berry, but the, the, the berry surface is covered by this wax. And so as the fungus invades the tissue, the wax is broken down and that's why we're seeing the disappearance of these C6 compounds. Not peculiar to Botrytis, we see it with the other bunch rot pathogens. More interestingly, we'll move along the chromatogram. We're now up to between 30 and 40 minutes retention time. Um, I've highlighted one particular peak there, beta damascanone, which is a desirable character that's present in our clean uh, grape berries, a clean juice, which disappears in our infected material. And it's replaced by a series of other peaks that we can see there in red. We're in the process of identifying these compounds, but we know they are uh, terpenoid compounds, but Damascanone is a sesquiterpenine, terpenoid of course. And so these are breakdown products of the beta Damascanone that occurs during infection. The role, if any of these in terms of off flavors is not known. They probably don't have a contribution to uh, unwanted earthy aromas, but what they do represent is a breakdown of these varietal characters that we do want. So a disappearance of the desirable characters in the infected grapes. Moving along to the targeted analysis. And so now we're looking at some of these earthy moldy characters uh, that, that are the well known. The main ones that we found in the juice uh, infected with Botrytis were three octanone, octin 3 and one octin 3 And these are the main ones that we find in a variety of horticultural crops infected with fungi. Interestingly, we didn't detect geosmin or methyl isoborneol, two other volatile organic compounds that are reported from uh, infected grapes with um, other, other fungal pathogens. And not surprisingly, you can see with increasing 
infection, we're getting increasing levels of these uh, compounds. Now, bearing in mind this is juice, uh, and I'll just draw your attention to the y-axis, the scale we have there is up to 30 micrograms per litre. So bear that in mind when we come to look at the wine samples. Now, turn the, our attention to the wine. Firstly, looking at acetic acid. Again, not much of a surprise here. Once we jumped from that level one to level two infection, a big jump in the amount of acetic acid up to one gram per litre, which I believe is uh, above the uh, uh, permitted limit for acetic acid. This is no doubt due to acetic acid bacteria, but the botrytis itself can also produce some acetic acid as well. Going back to the uh, mouldy earthy characters, um, looking at the wine now as opposed to the juice, it's not all bad news. Remember on the juice slide, the y-axis went up to 30 micrograms per litre. We're now looking at wine, finished wine, and we're now looking at lower levels. So a number of these compounds have been reduced. They, they, they've been taken out during the wine making process. Um, in fact, we, the one octane three own, which is a very low sensory perception threshold, is, was now uh, below the limit of detection. Does this matter? Well, it does still matter. There are the sensory perception thresholds. So octanone above 20 micrograms per litre, fine. One octane three ol is still an issue at our level one uh, infection level. Oh, sorry, at level two, but perhaps level one, we may be able to get away with it. The only um, rider I would sort of put on this, of course, is that those sensory perception levels are quoted for pure solutions. So when these compounds are in a wine matrix and there are other compounds there, we can get a, a synergistic effect. And so that perception level can actually be much lower. The next slide just shows the dynamics of these compounds during the winemaking process for our highest level of infection that you can see in the image there on the right hand slide. And you can see all three compounds diminish rapidly at the racking point uh, clarification. So we are able to get rid of a lot of these compounds that are probably associated with, with the skin and with the leaves, the dead yeast. The blue dotted line at the bottom there is the threshold for one octane three ohm. So that was a chemical analysis. Um, we then went on to do some sensory analysis and this, this is limited because it's limited by the volume of wines that we had, bearing in mind these were small ferments. So the ferments were one litre each and after uh, racking and so on, that volume decreased. So all we were really able to do was a sensory analysis based on visual appearance and also on, uh, on a smell test, on sniffing. There wasn't sufficient wine to do a detailed taste test. So we did it was a triangle test where we had 15 participants and they were asked to try and discriminate between the control, healthy uh, wine from the different levels of infection. And this basically supported our uh, chemical analysis that at the level one infection, um, half of the participants were not able to um, correctly um, differentiate the infected wine from the control wine, whereas half were, so that was not significantly different. But above that, the level two, three and four levels, the participants were clearly able to say that these wines were different based on smell and also on appearance. We would really like to can repeat this though with more sensory work by, by tasting the wine at these lower levels. So in terms of the thresholds, this is a work in progress. We still don't have the, the full answer. We know that it's going to be somewhere between level one and two based on the data so far. I suspect it's probably at level one or lower uh, once we've done the, the uh, more detailed sensory work. This equates to somewhere between about 0.3 and one gram dry weight of fungus per kilogram fresh weight of grapes. And so our next task is to more accurately 
quantify the fungal biomass in batches of grapes that are infected with botrytis and also repeat the work with more replicates around this level one visual score of botrytis contamination. Before I wrap up, I will say something about some of the other bunch rots because we're also working on these and I haven't said very much about these today, but I will say that we're conducting similar work on Aspergillus and Penicillium, the two main ones that we're concentrating on. So Aspergillus at the top there that produces this black mold and Penicillium that produces this uh, blue green mold. The issue for us with field work on these two fungi is you would hardly ever find a vineyard that has just Aspergillus or just Penicillium. Often they're occurring as secondary rots and they're often occurring as a complex. So that's limited progress with the work with these rots. What we have done is that we've taken bunches and inoculated these in the lab at known rates. And then we've mixed these with clean fruit that we've harvested from commercial vineyards to get some data that way. And what we've found uh, is that we get a different suite of compounds with these grapes and wine than we got from Petrius infected grapes. And we're in the process of identifying these. Some we've identified, some we want to look at a bit further. We don't know what impact these other compounds will have on wine quality, but we're hoping that some of them will serve as marker compounds and ultimately we will be able to um, use these to quantify these other fruit rots in, uh, in vineyards in difficult seasons. So what about remedial action? So let's say with whatever threshold we set, decide we've set on, what can we do at the wine production stage? We're exploring various things here. We've done some limited trials with fining agents, looking at bentonite, activated carbon and PVPP. And some of this work was done not on botrytis, but on a Another bunch rot, ripe rot, there on Cabernet Sauvignon that you can see on the right hand side of the slide there. This produces this orange mould. It's uh, quite widespread in um, places such as the Hunter and in parts of Queensland and in, and in tropical regions of the world. And we found that PVPP was able to remove um, uh, most of these compounds to some extent, but one octin three old would probably was removed the greatest from Cabernet Sauvignon affected right rot affected wine. And we want to extend this work to include our botrytis affected grapes that we're working on at the moment. So that almost wraps up the uh, sorry the, the webinar webinar for today. Just some conclusions here. Uh, so some conclusions off flavours accumulated and some desirable characters were depleted in our botrytis affected grapes and wine. The threshold for botrytis on Chardonnay grapes is somewhere between 0.3 and 1 gram fungus dry weight per kilogram of fruit, which is somewhere between this level one and perhaps one and a half based on that visual scale. We really do need to look at more vineyards, certainly more varieties. We want to extend the work to include a red variety we want to look at more vintages to validate and fine tune the thresholds. And there is a much, much more work to be done on some of the other rots. We know that the off flavors that they produce are different from Botrytis. Before I finish, I'll just bring up um, some other sources of information, a couple of Wine Australia fact sheets on bunch rots that some people may find useful. These don't deal specifically with uh, dealing with bunch rots and wine thresholds, but they give an overview of the different bunch rots. I also always refer people to the AWRI dog book um, as the definitive, definitive guide as to which uh, fungicides you can apply to wine grapes in Australia. Finally, I'd like to acknowledge the contribution of grape growers in various regions throughout New South Wales, the Hunter, Riverina and Tumbarumba. And this is not my my work on my own. It's the work that I've conducted with colleagues and various students at CSU over the years. And lastly, I'll acknowledge um, the funding body Wine Australia. Without their support, of course, this work would not be possible. 
and I'll end there and open up the webinar to uh, questions. Thank you. Okay, thanks very much for uh, detailing your research on this project, Chris. Um, and as Chris has indicated, we will now roll into a Q&A. Uh, so Chris is gonna stick around for a little while. If you've got any questions regarding um, this research or the topic, um, please start sending them in. Just a reminder, if you wanna ask a question, just open the Q&A part of the webinar and type your question in and click to send. And I'll relay your question through to Chris. So I've got a few questions already here, Chris. Um, the first question we had come through was um, from Warren, and Warren's asked, "Is there a simple bag test to a bag test to check for botrytis before visual symptoms show that can be formed earlier than varazin, varazin sure, or sure, shortly yeah. thereafter?" Yeah, sure. You 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 can you can um, you can harvest bunches and you can. Uh, place them in a plastic bag with a little bit of moist paper toweling and you know you don't need to incubate them under any special conditions don't put them in the fridge you know perhaps have them out under you know room temperature type conditions and see if botrytis will will grow out um, and certainly botrytis you know is probably latent in a lot of bunches and, and never finally you know fully comes out and expresses itself but yes that is a simple test if you're going to do that you need to think about sampling within the vineyard and you know getting a good uh, good perhaps think about where you're sampling in the vineyard and a good number of samples like typically in the past we used to talk about collecting 30 bunches at random from whichever part of the vineyard you wanted to, to investigate okay thanks for your question there warren now i've got another question here from bob and bob's asked do you have an estimate of the percentage of visual infection with level one and two. The, and that's that's the real problem, to be honest, because um, my interpretation of level one will be different from the next person's interpretation of level one. And all right, we might say level one is one or two berries per bunch, but every bunch differs in size. And so you can go down and, you know, sort of micromanage the situation and count all the berries in a bunch you know this bunch has 100 berries this next one has 150 but there really isn't time when you're close to vintage it has to be something more rapid so that visual estimate which we use a lot in plant pathology for diseases is okay to a point but when you've got a, um, a structure like a bunch of grapes that will vary in size and shape it's it's really not very accurate and that's i think that's one of our biggest problems in setting these thresholds is firstly measuring the amount of botrytis that's present okay thanks for your question there bob um, another question here from hugh was the lacase level correlated with the ergosterol levels the, that that's something we've not looked at. And to be honest, we've not concentrated too much on lacase because we've just found that lacase production by Petritus is variable. Essentially, why does the fungus produce lacase in the first place? It's not producing it to oxidize wine, make wine go brown. It's part of the armory of the fungus when it invades the tissue. It, it's used to break down great berry tissues. So if you've got berries that are highly damaged, chances are the fungus isn't gonna produce as much lacase. So we've found not great correlations between lacase and, and botrytis severity. So we haven't concentrated too much on lacase in this project at all, I must say. Okay, thanks for going through those questions. Chris, uh, looks like that's all we have with regard to the Q&A for today. Uh, so we might start to wrap up. Um, did you want to make any final comments before we uh, begin to finish the session? Yeah, look, there's one thing I, I will say. This is a bit of a bit of a plea for support from vineyards if you do experience botrytis this year. Um, so far over here in the eastern states, it seems like it's going to be a pretty hot uh, season. But in order to do this field work, we do need access to vineyards, ideally as close as possible to Wagga Wagga, where we can actually sample um, 
bunches that are affected with botrytis. So if anybody wishes to collaborate on this project, please contact me. I would appreciate it. Okay, great. Thanks for your final comments there. Um, we do actually have a, another question that's just come through, so I'll read it out to you. Yep. It's come through from Scott, who's asked, have you done any work on gluconic acid threshold levels for spoilage? And if so, do these levels measure total gluconic acid? No, no, we haven't. We, we have measured gluconic acid in terms of uh, quantifying it from grapes and wine, but we haven't looked at, at thresholds. The one thing I would say about gluconic acid is the variability in, in its production. I think gluconic acid is um, closely associated with the physiology of the fungus and the growth state. So where we're getting lots of... Um, aerial mycelium. So in that picture you can see on my closing slide there, there's quite a lot of dense mycelium. I don't know, look, this is circumstantial. My feeling is that gluconic acid is much more of a function of aerobic metabolism where we've got lots of aerial mycelium, where we've got dense mycelium. We seem to perhaps get less gluconic acid. We get huge amounts of gluconic acid with some of the other fungi, particularly things like aspergillus, uh, which produces a lot of aerial mycelium. So, no, we've not measured thresholds for gluconic acid. Okay, thanks for confirming that. Right, so I'd first like to extend a thank you to Chris for providing the content and going through this research with us. Uh, it's been a very informative session. And I'd also like to thank you, the audience, for participating. Attendees will receive a follow-up email um, and within that email will be a link to this recording. Uh, that was the last scheduled AWRI webinar for a, um, for a while. Our next scheduled webinar is in May. Um, there's still some details to be confirmed with regard to that session, but at this stage it's going to be held on uh, the 17th of May. Uh, that's a wrap for today. Thank you again for uh, joining the session and I look forward to seeing you at the next AWRI webinar.